And uh, the next speaker is uh, Jean-Pierre Buig, who is an anomaly in the sense of the previous speakers, since he has its origin in the Montpellier, Montpellier University. You later moved to ETH in Zurich, where you're now professor. Uh, I couldn't help stumbling on your CV. You were one of the chief editors of Tecton of Physics as well, so I say to you, behave. <laughs> uh, Professor Berg's research is in structural geology and tectonics, with applications in a wide, wide range of areas, but you have a very long experience in working in the Tibetan Plateau. Your presentation is directed at the role of volcanic arcs and collisional tectonics with a focus on the Khoistan, just as the previous speaker introduced to us the tectonic style. So please, by that, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Thanks also to Vicky to introduce my talk, because I will show you what is the geological perspective to be quite convinced now that there were a double subduction. And that drives me to a few questions about what is below Tibet. And that will be the end of my talk. I want to apologize because I really feel like a lost donkey in this assembly. I never worked in the field or in the office with Peter Molnar, although we made in Montpellier in 1979, if I remember well, you were just visiting Tibet, and I was going to go into Tibet. And uh, at the end of my thesis, I came to the big question that we are talking about, is that I concluded, and my bosses were not very happy, that uh, one suture in, suture in southern Tibet is a double suture. And that was not quite new, because people who had worked in Khoistan, which is the western part, know that there are two sutures in the West Himalayas and only one so-called Tsangpo suture in Tibet. And how do we go from two to one? We go from two to one because of the Khoistan, and I will first take you through a long journey, purely geological, so that the others can sleep. I will show you a lot of rocks, <laughs> and these rocks, I hope, will convince you that we have an intra-oceanic arc. It was also a discussion in the 80s, probably when you visited with all your uh, Swedish friends. But this uh, intra-oceanic arc had a complex history, and we have to take into account the complex history of the arc to know what may happen to the collisional system. That takes me in my, the second part of my talk, where I will show you a few experiments I could have shown in progress numerical experiments, but I thought you would be tired of that. So I will show you analog experiments. These are old analog experiments, 15 years old, and they have an advantage. They have caveats with respect to the numerical, but they have advantages that you work with real material. And working with real material gives you ideas. doesn't give you solutions, but gives you ideas. And with these ideas, I will conclude on what I think about the tectonics of this area. So the first question, working on the southern Tibet, was, yes, OK, we know we have a suture zone. But in the end, as a geologist, what means a suture zone? And the suture zone is something we teach. Guys, you had an ocean, you have a shelf on a continental margin on one side, and it comes, there is an arc above the subduction zone, for example, the Andes, and you close the system and you have a margin for arc. That's an interesting question, an arc system collision. I will show you that why there is no for arc in any orogenic system we know from the Archean. People talk about arcs, people talk about margins, never about the for arcs. And in complex systems, yes, you have a subduction, you have an intra-oceanic arc with or without a ridge between this intra-oceanic arc and the passive continental margin, and we close the system and we have to find every element of the system as geologists. Otherwise, we have a problem. Maybe geology is useless if we cannot find what existed. So, 
Taking this into two considerations, my question was, when we go into the Western Himalayas, and namely here in the Khoistan, why do we see the geologists, they think like me, with their legs? Why do we have two sutures and not two in Tibet? And since then, I had that as a geologist. You know, you always have a small piece of rock that jumps in your, in your shoes. Then you try to walk with that, and then you have to take your shoes off and try to solve the problem. So I went in Khoistan when it was still possible, and I did a lot of work with many people. What we know is that, yes, it's part of this collisional system. I didn't take the latest publications that you produce with Johan, for example, because in the end it doesn't change much the picture, and I confess this figure was ready, so I didn't have to paint yours. And what we know also is that the paleomagnetic uh, data shows that Khoistan was somewhere, and we know these are huge uncertainties, but somewhere in the equatorial regions in the Cretaceous when these so-called red beds because the geologists they see only colors, the red beds were deposited. And at that time, the northern margin of Eurasia was further north, so we have to close this system. And from the early work in the Khoistan, the interpretation was that we have a single arc which was produced on top of a north-dipping subduction of the Tethys Ocean, and that this arc has been squeezed between Asia, the Karakoram system, which is actually an arc, as we have heard, and the India, with a hell lot of different events, which we are going to try to document when we map that, and we will see that we come to a slightly different pictures in which you see this huge so-called Chilas body. You will hear that this name again is not the base of the arc, but pertains to another kind of history, but is part of the arc history. So this is the map which is in progress. I am not completely responsible for the colors. I realize that the projectors is playing tricks with us. And the geological trip will take you from the northeast to the southwest, which is almost the section that every geologist who has been there has been doing because there is a main road. But what I am going to show you is a lot of things which are not on the main road. I apologize. <laughs> so this is the section I'm doing. I'm not very proud of it because I still have another piece of stone in my shoe which is this northern part. We don't have, and we didn't have time to finish the work. But you can see that there is this northern suture, Shyok, as it is called after a river in India, which is separating the Kalkalkaline Plutonic Arc, the southern arc which we find to the Lhasa block, from the Khoistan Arc itself. You have a northern part which is a, a real batholit, which is an agglomeration and a multiplication and a real mixture of different sort of magmas, in which you can find some enclaves of sediments and volcanic rocks. And then this huge Chilas complex, and I will show you that it is the result of an extension that the arc has been rifted, Rifted the northern part from the southern part. The southern part is the deep part of the arc, down to these green rocks, which are the mantle at the time of the arc formation, at about 110, 120. And the hull is first on India. You realize we bring directly the arc on the Indian continent with very, very few pieces of rocks, which are blue schist and Eocene bearing fossil sediments, which might have been part of the four arc, but if this is one kilometer wide, we are happy. The section that was produced before us was uh, through the English team, and my coward, I'm happy to pay tribute to his work, had drawn this huge anticline for the Chilas complex. And they were thinking that the Jijal complex, which is here, these mental rocks were the same in the middle of the arc. It had been folded. And when I say to Mike, but Mike, you draw an attic line which is 50 kilometers high, uh, he told me, yeah, well, it doesn't matter. He was happy with us, with this. And 
I will show you that in the end, I didn't believe him, but today I believe him because the geometry is correct. The difference is that this is not a fold, this is a diopter. So let's go. The northern suture is this sort of outcrop. The outcrops are good, so this is what I like with these countries. You don't have to invent geology. You know, in the Alps, there is no forearc, there is no arc, but there is grass and, and cows. So <laughs> at least in Kohistan, you just go and you see here the contact between the Karakoram, the uh, granodiorite, which are here dated at 120, and many slices, you can see also Budin aged Buddhas of different rocks. This northern Kohistan suture zone is a very, very faulted region. A lot of imbricate rocks of so-called Ophiolithic origin, actually only Habsburgites, which have been serpentinized, and basalt, and in white, a whole sort of sediments which have absolutely no strain. No strain, you can see here a facies of deep sea sediments, turbidites, in which you have the ripples and everything the sedimentologist may enjoy. You have here shallower sediments, there are huge uh, deltas that come abo above these uh, turbidites, in which you can recognize the graded bedding in sandstones, which are more or less foliated. And pillow lavas, this is one of my partner, I mean, scientific partner, in the field with these undeformed pillows. So, yes, we have evidence that there was an oceanic basin. This oceanic basin has been strongly faulted, has been strongly faulted, has been active to Paleocene. So, open as sediments up to the Paleocene. Thanks to the fossils, including gasteropods. And then there was a big controversy because people wanted to, talk, to close this area before the age of deformed granite, which was then 100 and 105 or so. So the idea was, yes, we close the northern suture at 100, and then we close India against Kohistan at 50. It doesn't work. We have Paleocene marine fossils, gasteropods, and you can see, for example, on this picture, that deformed granite may be younger than undeformed granite. Well, so what are you dating? It's the problem, deformation, if you have magmatic emplacement against cold rocks, you have strongly shear during magmatic emplacement, solid state deformation on the border of your plutonic rocks. So when you date a deformed rocks, you don't date a regional deformation, you date the rock. And maybe the deformation in contains. And then we have more evidence that things happen younger, that here you might recognize deformed pillows. Here is written, vote for Muhammad. And these deformed pillows are cut by a dike which is 70 million years, 75 million years. But of course, this deformation again is related to the, to the emplacement of the many plutonic rocks I've shown you in this area. Furthermore, if you make some dating, you can see that we can extract zircons, which have a nice zoning, which is typically magmatic. The rocks look deformed. These are gabbroic rocks, but their age is at 45, against the suture. So we come to a first conclusion, that deformed and metamorphic uh, plutonic rocks in the northern Kohistan show that the magmatic history lasted into Eocene times. So the way to close the northern suture as early as people thought is not fitting the geological information. Then we move a bit more to the south. We have typically plutonic rocks which are intrusive into different sorts of rocks. You can recognize in places yellow things, uh, layo, yellow uh, weathered rocks, which are typical for copper sulfide 
zones. And in between these rocks, you can see again almost unfelt silimonite bearing turbidite, deep facies sediments. Silimonite facies simply because they are against gabbros. When the gabbros have intruded, their solid is about 700 degrees, you have silimonite facies. And volcanic rocks here are agglomerates. So what, what we call the northern part of the Koistan arc with this plutonic area contains deep sea basins. There was something, and even more, when we have bottom conglomerates, they were Jurassic to Cretaceous fauna, and the youngest fossils we could find into almost unmetamorphosed limestones, which are within the, the batolites, are late Paleocene. So the history of the Koistan arc goes younger and younger. Volcanoclastic sequences, evidence of basins. Unfortunately, everything is intruded, everything is deformed. I don't know how wide were these basins. They were there. But maybe there was a lot of space there in terms of plate tectonics where are the boundary of my plates, which I don't know. I have huge geological uncertainty. I've seen this morning a uh, balanced cross-section on Bhutan. I mean, you can pro produce sections where you say I have 127 kilometers short turning, but this is more or less 50%. So don't try to fit so well the geological data. The geological data, they have huge uncertainties. We don't say it because otherwise we would have no job. <laughs> but... We have uncertainties. And here, I don't know how wide it, that was. It's a point on which I will come back. Then we come to this Chilas complex. This Chilas complex is this dark blue thing. It was reputedly the biggest plutonic gabbroic rock in the world. Well, that's again because people were walking on one outcrop on the main KKH and looking at the rock and saying, this is a nice gabbro. It's a nice gabbro, but in the end, uh, what is happening? It is dated at 85. Remember that? 85, it fits more or less the ages we had in the Koistan Batholith. And this is the huge fold. It was coring the huge fold that uh, my cohort had drawn. And I will show you that in the end, when you look at this gabbro, this is the gabbro, it is associated with peridotites, ultra-basic rocks, and this was the part of the PhD of uh, Oliver Yagut. You can see the contacts. They are intimately associated. When you look at the contacts in more details, you can see that this unique gabbro is in fact a multi-plutonic body in which you can define contacts of no right into no right, which is not very easy, unless you think with your legs. And when you look at the contact between this peridotite and this gabbro, you can see that I've spent a lot of time drawing all these uh, very complex features, and they are typical for a reactional system between the peridotite, mantle peridotite, and magmatic rocks, which have been reacting with these mantle rocks to produce the gabbro. For example, you have clinopyroxines in triple junctions between peridotites. You have denite dikes between amphibole bearing peridotites. And then you can see in places into the peridotites, typically this yellow uh, color that comes from uh, uh, the iron in olivine, small pre fracturing. Uh, zones in which you can see that some magma or fluids of melt have percolated and they are rimmed by minerals that show that it is reactional between melt and the rock. And then the contact, you can see these strong features, which are burgeoning features that indicate that one is not intrusive into the other. Both were mushes, which have been associated at the time they were produced and at the time when melt was reacting with the mental rocks at the time when this uh, gabbroic system was emplaced, at 85 million years. I draw you 
I will draw your attention on these things, which are drawn in the next section. This is what the contact is. You can see here these nice features. The gabbro norite, the peridotite, change in color. I always tell to my students, if it changes color, it changes in composition. So uh, it's just to help the geochemist and the geophysicist in the assembly. But you can see very well along this contact, these so-called layered features. And I will show you these layered features here, where they are almost horizontal. And on a very small place, if you have better eyes than I have, they fit exactly this point. And these layered features are down there, here. And you can see that they are burgeoning upward. These are small diaperic instabilities that indicate that this layering was almost horizontal at the time it was deposited, and that we have these vertically oriented small features. But when I come here, almost at the contact, these almost vertical features, they are deformed, and you might see here that they are even folded. And these folds show that the dunite body, the peridotite, were raising with respect to the gabronorite. So the, 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 the dunite and the peridotites we have in this huge anticline were in fact diaperic system conduits of melt which have been in place at 85 more or less 10 million years within the Kohistan arc itself. And what does it mean? The rocks which are associated with this gabronorite and these peridotites are also hornblendites, and you can see huge massif of hornblendites, sometimes one kilometer thick, but I could not take a picture of one kilometer width, so I took just this picture because it was almost the same size as my hammer. But you can see that really this is opening. So this huge body which is all along the arc is rifting of the arc, and while there was rifting, all this magmatic system has been intruding the oldest part of the arc. So if you accept, we come to the second sequence that the ultramafic rocks were focusing magma conduits and were in place during splitting of the Kuistan arc. Where I have to salute the work that my cohort has done is that in these diorites and granodiorites, you can see very, very nice layering, as I have shown, with graded bedding. And he had very, very well observed that on both sides, the so-called younging direction, that is the graded into the rocks, is diverging. But it's diverging because these conduits were alimenting the gabronorite in the two directions. So, this is just to say hello to my cohort. He was a good drinker, as I am. <laughs> we go further south. In, uh, we meet again sediments. And the pressure temperature conditions we find when you look at the metamorphism on these rocks is about the same to the north and to the south of the Gabron Ariorai. So it's really the splitting system. We do not have any other position of one thing over it. And we enter in what is called the Southern Amphibolite. The Southern Amphibolite is a huge pile of sheared to extremely deformed plutonic rocks that associate gabbros, granodiorites, diorites. You can see the original rocks, for example, in these places. And in some other places, you can see shear zones, extremely sheared, a hornblendite intrusion into a norietic gabbro, and this is the middle crust of the Koistan arc. I will not document too much about the petrology. You can look at the magmatic petrology of these rocks, at the metamorphic petrology into the shear zones, and you can see that you have paragazite garnet in, in occurring into the mylonite, which means that these shear zones were formed during over pressure or the, during thickening of what was above. And what is most important is that an age 
has been produced with argon argon, and this age is for horn blend at about 500 degrees 83, which is almost the age of the Kohistan arc. And we could not find anything else in this southern part. That is, the southern part of the Kohistan arc was cooled at that time, was cooled at the time there was rifting. And we could not find in this southern part any rock that is younger in terms of intrusion than that. So the Kohistan arc is two parts. The southern part, which has a short-lived history, and the northern part, both separated by resting systems, how wide they were, I have no idea today. Further south, below the shear zones, we really entered into the crest mantle transition. That is the deep crest of the arc. I will not talk too long about it. You can see this garnet into garnet bearing gabbro. These are granulites. These are ultramafic granulites. This is something we have heard already this morning. We don't have only within Indian continent granulites and ultramafic granulite facies rocks. These granulite facies rocks, they are here outcropping, and you can see a sharp contact between these white rocks and these black rocks. You can guess that compared to the previous slide, these rocks are finer grain. This is an intrusive contact of the granulite facies gabbros into the moho, what we call the moho. These are ultramafic rocks, pyroxenite, hornblendite. We will see more rocks. That to tell you that this is the contact, and you can see that that was formed during the arc building because this sharp contact is still crossed by small veins of plagioclase and other sort of magmatic melt rocks. And indeed, when we look at the rocks which are below, hornblende, garnet, clinoparexin, garnetite, you can see the size of the rocks. These are the mantelic rocks, and they have been dated by Duim and his collaborator in EPSL 2007 at 117 million years. So we are dealing here with the mantle, reacted mantle with melt, and the lower part of the arc at 120. So no way we can compare these 120 million years old rocks, which were formed at about 14, 20 kilobars, depending what you use as pressure barometer, with the Kohistan, uh, with the Chilas, which was 85 million years old, and which was crystallized at about 7 to 8 kilobars. We have to separate them. And then we are really into this deep mantle. Typically, you have dunites. You can see the mantelic fabric, which is underlined here by chromite grains. And the hull is cut by dikes, which are uh, pathways for the melt. This very light green is typical for chromium-rich pyroxenes, which are stable only under mantle uh, conditions. So we know very well that this is part of the arc history, and that we deal with the uppermost part of the mantle below the arc. Which brings me to this part, where you have a very old part which stopped at about 80 million years in the south. Then you have a system in extension in the middle, the rift system, and all these plutonic rocks which are in the north. And remember that then, what we have here at the bottom is Peridotite, they are serpentinites, and in fact, when you look at the rocks, I never call them the main mantle thrust, as most people say, because every structural criteria that we can find are normal faults. So I don't want to call a normal fault a thrust. So I call it the industry structure, and we are just below, 500 meters below, into the eclogites, which were mentioned this morning, that bear coesite. I don't use micro diamonds. Micro diamonds, there are clouds in space. I don't think the very high pressure in space and very high temperature. Micro diamond 
Stability is another story, but Corezoite is okay. So we had India, which was very deep, and I follow uh, O'Brien and the Chinese and the Japanese. Oof, what did I say? The Chinese uh, people who really looked at these rocks, and they say that these rocks were about 100 kilometers deep, were part of India below the Sutio zone at 50 million years. This is what we have heard this morning. So on that, many people agree. And so we come to the Kohistan, lies directly on the continental India, and my question is, guys, where is the four arc? That continental India was subjected down to 100 kilometers by 50, and that the suture acted as a normal fault. And I did not solve my problem, I just did my geology work. So my geologist's work goes on because I try to be intelligent with what I call a pencil model. That is, I take a pen, I take a piece of paper I'm with my color pens, because I learned to use that at uh, kindergarten, and uh, I try to make a model. But my model comes that I have to involve two such a zone. Because I mentioned we have 120 million years old calcalkaline rocks in the Karakoram system. We have a lot of 120 magmatic rocks into the Kohistan system, and that India is going to come later. And I've come to the answer that, yes, I had an arc, but this arc had a complex history at 85, at 85, which is still earlier than closure of any system. So now, how can we preserve this arc, because I have no arc, or I thought I had no arc and only one suture in southern Tibet, and now I have this double system in, in Khoistan. What is wrong in Khoistan and right in Tibet, or vice versa? So these are the questions I try to answer. So I can use first a very simple sketch to borrowed to Mark Kloss, where you made calculations and you can show that, yes, if the arcs are very young, whatever the production rate, uh, they will be negatively buoyant, they don't want to subduct, and then if they are getting old, they can subduct. Yeah. We can then play with magma production and age to preserve an arc on the surface. But what we know also is that you have a lot of seismic profiles coming out from the arc systems which we know today. And these arcs are multiple forms. You can have a single arc, all of them have nearly the same age, which is reasonably thick or reasonably thin. You have this sort of arc. You have the model we have been talking about with the Mariana and the uh, uh, rift between the active arc and the remnant arc, and so on. So, which collision are we talking about? So for that, I take you into the numerical models. These are numerical models I published with uh, and the Boutelier, who is a student we shared. And we worked with analog systems. And I draw your attention that we used rheologies which are thermally sensitive. So it's not perfect, but you can see that the rheological profiles could be drawn depending on geotherm which is imposed by a lower heater and a upper heater. And the material is derived from oil industry and was produced specially for us in Moscow by an institute of material systems who were trying to work out this perfect rheology, which we checked. We don't buy everything that the Russian says. Pravda in you is Niesta and vice versa, you know? So these are the models, we can run a systematic. I will immediately draw your attention, I will not develop much about these ones, is that you see you have a continent arriving, an arc, and a back arc. If you don't have a back arc, you keep your arc here, but you have subduction that entrains the whole of the four arc in the bottom. Here, it's even better, you can see that the whole arc system and four arc systems will be subducted. Then we can play with systematics. Systematics, we take a thin, strong arc, no back arc basin, and you have what I say. Your arc stays where it is, all the suture is here, the four arc disappears, and the continent goes down, and we have what we have 
That is, we can keep this arc on the surface, but we don't have the double subduction system. A thin, strong arc with a back arc basin does tend to disappear entirely, and the thin arc is entirely subducted with its lithosphere. That may explain why in some collisional orogens, we don't have arcs, we don't have four arcs. The, arc, the Alps, for example, what I'm interested in is not Himalayas or what, I'm looking from the Alps to the Himalayas, and we have very different systems which in place show arcs, in place do not show arcs, never show the four arc again. Thick and weak arc, we can keep a part of it, but the, the four arc disappears. I don't want to bother you with too many, just to show that we have played with these rheologies, these uh, profiles, and we always obtain the same sort of result. I have another one. Here, the upper arc is scrapped and blah, blah, and the lower crust is subducted. So after this systematic work, we can extend again with thick and strong, and we can arrive to this problem. Arc obduction, we have several conditions to have it. It must be reasonably old and thick to be preserved. If it is not old and thick, it disappears entirely into the subduction zone with its four arc lithosphere. And from there, I come back to my problem. I have in the west of the Himalayas, Kohistan and Ladakh arc, yes. And in fact, along the suture zone, this is why I had this problem in my shoe, we have very small remnants of arcs. So I do believe, like Vicky said a bit earlier, that we had a system like this one, where you had thick old arcs or arcs which were in buoyancy conditions that allowed them to be maintained at the surface, abducted on India when they met the continent, and somewhere westward, thinning, maybe younging of the arcs, which had to be entirely subducted beneath South Tibet. So this is what I published in a strange journal published by the Chinese because they asked me, I had this double subduction system with blue schist, which I did not mention, which were exhumed at 90 million years. And I had arcs which were varying in terms of composition, thickness, buoyancy from west to east, so that when they came, they closed this I don't know how you call it, but I don't give names to the plate. This plate was entirely subducted beneath the Ladakh, the Karakoram, and southern Tibet until there was collision. There was collision here to the west between the buoyant arcs, but the other arcs were subducted beneath Tibet. And in fact, in the bulk plutonic history of southern Tibet, what people call Gangdizi, because nobody knows what is Gangdizi, you have several phases of plutonism crisis. One, uh, Cretaceous to Paleocene, and it restarted after the Paleocene to the Eocene. So what I want to show you are uh, experiments which I did also 15 years ago, which were never published because they failed. They failed because, you see, we block the system when uh, some of the slabs reach the contacts of the boxes. But what they show you very well in many ways, and maybe I should play it again, is that you have an interplay between the two subduction zones. They rarely play together, but you still have these systems where the four arcs disappear, and depending on one length of the suture zone, what is the drag force, what made your career, and the relative lengths which are subducted, you have this interplay and you have different events, and you don't close everything until, until really this continent comes and closes really everything because you have reached a system where you have a very strong stress system. So yes, I will not insist very much on this uh, uh, 
geochemical work, which was done by Pierre Bouillol and uh, Oliver Yaguzzi. They finished with my samples, actually, the work on the Koistan. This is the different uh, content into hafnium, neodymium versus the age of the plutonic rocks, actually the zircons which were analyzed. And you can see that they have traces of the events I've been talking about. 85, there is something happening. We change the source. Or is it a deeper source? Is it another source in the mantle? Is it more sediments? We don't know yet, but there is something at 85. This is the rifting of the Koistan arc. And then there are collisions at 50, and these collisions is the sign of collision between India and Koistan. And then when uh, you two take again their work, this is something that Vicky has shown also, that the collision between India and Koistan is at about 50, and it's only 10 million years about 40 uppermost Miocene that you really finish to close your system, including the basin with Paleocene fossils, which was north of Koistan. And the same signal come for other isotopes. So I don't want to bother to you too much because you hope coffee, but this is how it comes. We were here. We still had collision in the west, but we still had to close some ocean in the South Tibet. And I wonder why, actually, the Shigatse Basin is not folded before the latest Eocene. The Shigatse Basin, for people who don't know, would be this turbidite and molas basin, which is just all along the Tsangpo suture zone. And then once everything is closed, India finished to close that, yes, you begin to produce the Himalayas as a lay product of the suture history. What I have come here is that in summary, we have collisions and we had two subduction in this zone. And we don't know how much of sand there was between India and Asia. That is the discussion on how big was Great India might be completely irrelevant. It might have been another oceanic plate which is gone. That early collision did not build high mountains because we know that all, all these times of successive collisions and, and, and playback and feedback between two subduction systems, we were below sea level. And to finish, almost, is that Arx and Forax may have been subducted beneath southern Tibet and may participate with current crust. Which brings me to my latest, latest slides. When I say that, Forax fire may have been subducted. Yes, how? I show you a set of experiments which were not published also. This is how I can subduct and how I can keep things below a continent when I play with analog systems and different pressure temperature systems. I have no answer which one is good. The only thing I say is that when I look at these profiles and people are very peremptory, they say, oh, these are eclogites. I say, guys, yes, we have seen this morning you have xenolites of ultramafic granulites, peridotites, eclogites. This is what we have in an arc. So how can you tell me that the Shoshonites are not sampling an arc which is beneath Tibet? Peter, we never worked together, but there is one thing I learned from you is that we have to be very modest with our results. So I hope you will forgive me also to have had my last, last lecture in this school in Koistan. Thank you very much.